your call. And thank you for... Time now for the Old Trailblazer broadcast with Pastor Albert Pendarvis. The Old Trailblazer broadcast can be heard Monday through Friday at 11.15 a.m. as well as Sundays at 6.15 a.m. here on WPAQ, AM 740 FM 106.7, Mount Airy, North Carolina. This is the Old Trailblazer broadcast. This is Pastor Albert Pendarvis. That's how it's done. Sorry. This is Tim oh, Fry. Here we are. Now, we, we done left Floyd's, and we got John all cleaned up, looking good and handsome as we can get. And uh, we, we're going to come up here to see my good friend, Mr. Kelly Epperson, here at WPAQ. Uh, Kelly is uh, just an amazing person. Uh, he's uh, followed, and followed the torch and carried the torch for his dad, Ralph. And um, it's going to be an amazing little view here. Uh, thank you so much for uh, oh, Norm, entertaining thank you. us, Kelly. Thank and, you. Um, my pleasure. We'll uh, head inside and, and get some look at, at some amazing studio footage in here. We get the door. Open. All right. All right. Man, if walls could talk. I'm telling you, this, this place, place. Would, would talk up a storm. I'm telling you. Well, um, could you tell the folks on the Appalachian Channel a little bit about where we're at and what we're doing? Well, we're in, we're in the lobby of WPAQ Radio. We're almost 76 years old. Won't be long. February, Groundhog Day rolls around. We'll turn 76. There's part of the original floor uh, in the carpet that we framed out, a uh, tile floor. And I uh, did not want the people who put the carpet in to cover that up. So that's part of the original floor there. Uh, but this is my picture of my dad up on the wall. This was about a month before he fell in his driveway and then unfortunately never recovered from the fall. Uh, he was awarded, uh, inducted into the North Carolina Broadcasters Hall of Fame in April of 2006. He passed away in May of 2006. But I'm thankful that uh, he wanted to get into this business. Because if not for him, we wouldn't be doing this radio thing. There's not a person in Mount Airy who's not thankful for, for what he did and what you're still doing, carrying on the great work that he did. Well, thank you. There's, those are tremendous shoes to fill. But every day we try to keep that pledge going where he promised to the FCC that he would set aside time each and every day to promote uh, the music of the area, the roots of this area, the bluegrass and the Blue Ridge Mountain style string music. And we're still doing that all day today, every day. When I first moved here a couple years ago, one of the things that, that I was uh, worried about, we want to have a good radio station to listen to that's local, and I don't want to listen to satellite stuff like that and things. And sure enough, I stumbled over WPAQ, and I went, well, dang, this is great. But I, I, I love all the aspects. I mean, you have... I don't even have to go into services on Sunday. We, we've got services, uh, church services on Sunday, and um, and then, you know, hourly uh, weather reports mm -hmm. and news reports. And on top of that, first time I ever heard it, we've got um, obituaries. And right. I think that is such a great aspect. We've always had the obituaries, and uh, that is one thing that is consistently listen to uh, on a daily basis. We do them two or three times a day. And uh, if we miss a name or mispronounce a name, we get phone calls. <laughs> I think we're pretty sensitive about that. I'm uh, sure. But yeah, it's, it's important to be a part of the community. Uh, one thing that my dad wanted to stress is he wanted to have local programming. He wanted uh, the whole family to be able to enjoy what he put out on WPAQ. And he wanted something unique and to offer programming that was not yet being served. And he said if there were 26 radio stations up and down the dial pretty much playing the same thing, why would I want to be number 27? And Wise man. An another thing you mentioned about the, uh, the ministry, uh, the, the religious programming, that is a big part of WPAQ. My, my grandmother... Lula, he wanted my dad, she wanted my dad to be a minister. And he said, I don't feel that calling. But I tell you what, if I get my radio station built and running, I promise you we will have 
Christian programs, we will have the gospel of Jesus Christ on, on a daily basis. How about that? Will that be okay? And it'll be a ministry to the community. She said, okay, that will be fine. And it sure is. Thank I, you. And I appreciate it. We all owe him a great debt of gratitude for that. Well, thank you so much. All right, Kelly, if you'd give uh, the folks at the Appalachian Channel a little bit of uh, history about your dad and the studio, and they're going to eat this up. This is, this is good stuff. Okay, well, I'm, I'm excited to, to relive that past. Well, my dad, he first had an um, interest in radio. He would listen to radio at night. They had a windmill up on top of their house that would power the radio. It served as a battery and it would power the radio and they could pick up distant radio stations. And there was one station in Siloam Springs, Arkansas on the campus of John Brown University. The president of the school was making a talk one night and he was inviting prospective students, find a way to Siloam Springs, Arkansas and we will put you to work and you can earn your way into an education. My dad got all excited and he told his parents that's what he wanted to do. And they said, that's what you will do. You will go to Siloam Springs, Arkansas. The trouble is there wasn't good transportation, wasn't enough of it back then. So he ended up, they brought him down to an intersection in Mount Airy at Rockford Street and where Highway 52 is. And they set him out and they watched till somebody came along to pick him up. He hitchhiked all the way to Siloam Springs, Arkansas, which is almost touching Oklahoma. It's in the northeast, northwest corner of Arkansas. Well, he got several rides and they would take him a spell and then he would do a little thing he called the hand bone where he'd slap his hands and then come down over his, his, his leg like that and get attention because there were a lot of hitchhikers back in the day. So you had to try to get some kind of crazy routine or something they would stop to see what you were doing. Some guy came along and said, what are you doing? What kind of fool carries on like that? He said, well, I'm just trying to get attention of some other fool to come along here and give me a ride down the road. Well, okay, get in, let's go. So he'd continue on. Well, after about a week, he got to Arkansas and he sent a postcard back to his parents and the family telling them that he had arrived safely. And they put him to work on the dairy, the dairy farm. Well, he didn't want to do that. He said, I've been on the farm all my life. I'd rather do the radio station. Uh, you've got a campus station. I'd really, I'm really interested in radio. So they gave him a job at the radio station on campus. And he finished there at Siloam Springs, Arkansas. He came home. He put up a little station in his house. He built a, a little studio up in the second level of the house, the old farmhouse in Ararat, Virginia, which is not too far up the road here. And uh, he, he was able to, to transmit people singing and playing instruments and preaching, whatever they wanted to do. He'd put them in the front yard or a parlor out down below and uh, they could pick them up as far as White Plains. That's pretty good little distance. But they would come around every day. He had this little radio station operating for a year or more. And uh, what, Now, what year was that? This was back about 43, 44. Okay. And uh, there was Sunday, my grandmother, very religious lady, she said, now, I don't want this, this just any music played on Sunday. It needs to be good Christian gospel music. And uh, he said, well, what about Johnson's Old Gray Mule? She said, that's not going to work. And he said, well, <laughs> the Bible says to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And I think Johnson's old gray mule is a joyful noise. That's for sure. So anyway, she, she didn't care much for some of the programming on Sunday. But, and then it came to the point where he went to, uh, to, to well, he went on to Washington, D.C., he served in the Naval Research Lab during World War II. He worked on walkie-talkies and radar and different communications equipment. He came back home and he was determined to have a radio station and he loved the music of the area, the, he especially loved the banjo. And he wanted to be able to make this available to more people. Some way to do it was to have a radio station. 
So he commissioned to the FCC, petitioned to them that he would provide daily programming, recognizing and promoting music native to the area. So the FCC granted him the license. They started building in 46. They ended up uh, late 47 completing. They got all the testing done. They did a lot of tests after midnight. The AM stations back in those days, you, could, you were permitted to broadcast with your full power to test the equipment. Wow. And we had some of the early groups like Glenn McPeak and the Green Valley Boys. They were the very first group to perform during the test sessions. Well, Groundhog Day 1948, we signed on the air and there were people lined up out on the, in the driveway up and down the road wanting to see this big event to take place. We were on the air for the first time and we've been doing essentially the same type thing, programming for all these nearly 76 years. Wow, that's amazing. And, and it leads into this studio and, and I know of uh, coming here and done some interviews with you and spent some time here in the studio itself. It, this is a homegrown thing. I mean, your, your, your dad, I'm not going to take any, I want you to tell a story, but I mean, your dad's hands on everything here. And, and it is basically homegrown music for, for homegrown people. And uh, we're lucky enough to have you in this community and to share it throughout the rest of the country. So maybe we can go on in there and, and, and show you some wonderful stuff. Love to. Let me take okay. you into Studio A, Norm. All right, that want, sounds great. I know you've been there before, but I want oh, you yeah. to see some more things in there. These uh, doors, by the way, were made by my grandfather. They're soundproof doors. He had a sawmill on the farm, and he cut the lumber and then made these doors himself. Very thick, very heavy doors, as you can feel. Oh, yeah. And this paneling is grooved paneling. They did that themselves. There was not much in the way of material back during the war days. The war was coming to an end, or was ending, and there just wasn't much available. So they had to do a lot of this by hand. This is where everybody wants to come and see this microphone. This is the ribbon mic, RCA ribbon mic. It has a crystal inside. It was one of the original microphones and still used today, and it sounds great. What about so, the breath that has been in that microphone? Oh, wow. You, if you could capture the breath on the microphone, everyone who has been somebody in this kind of bluegrass music, in the world of bluegrass music, has been here at one time or another. We're talking Charlie and Bill Monroe, Ralph and Carter Stanley, Mother Maybell Carter, Roy Acuff, Mac Wiseman. In fact, Mac Wiseman was employed here at WPAQ for a little I while. I have no idea. Great story about Mac. He went on to live in Nashville, Tennessee, performed on the Grand Ole Opry. He was known worldwide. A lot of folk songs and bluegrass songs. But anyway, Mac uh, had been in Raleigh at a radio station there, and he came to Mount Airy and he needed a job. He needed to work radio, continue to work in radio and play his music, entertain. So he came to the radio station one Sunday morning and there was only an announcer here. The announcer directed him to my dad's home. <laughs> he went and knocked on the door on Sunday morning. My dad came to the door. He said obviously he was getting ready for church. He was shaving, had shaving cream on his face. He said, Mr. Epperson, I'm Mac Wiseman and I'm coming to see you today because I want you to give me a job at your radio station. And my dad said, well, Mac, be honest with you, I think we're pretty well taken care of right now. He said, no, you need me. You need me to work for you. My dad likes, liked his persistence. So he said, I'll tell you what, you come on by tomorrow morning, Monday morning, you come on by and see me and we'll talk further. Well, he ended up getting a job here, he announced, and he headed up the WPAQ merry-go-round, which at that time was at the Pick Theater. Right. Which is, there's still some, a little bit uh, of the Pick Theater still left in some of that, the building right there in the alleyway. Right down the hallway where the arcade sign is. Arcade now. sign yep. is. Yep. There's still, you can go in a room and you can still see some of the rows of chairs and part of the theater that's, that was there. But that was where the merry-go-round was held every Saturday. They filled the house. They had a variety of entertainment. 
They had a comedian. They had uh, all kinds of bands that would take turns. It was like the Grand Ole Opry, but on a Mount Airy scale. How about uh, uh, two of my favorites, Flat and Scruggs? Oh, Flat and Scruggs. We have actually one picture of Flat and Scruggs at, the, at a WPAQ microphone. Not this one. Right. But, yes, they were definitely here. What would happen is these big-name artists, they were not as big yet. They were on their way up to the top. Well, they would be doing shows all over the country, especially in this corner of the world. Right. So they would come to do a show at a, at a schoolhouse or some other uh, community event building, and they needed to publicize where they were going to be in the area. So the best way would be to come and play live on this radio station, on WPAQ, because everyone listened. And they'd go and fill up the places. People would hear them on the radio early in the morning, 6 or 6.30 in the morning, performing. And it would fill up the, the schoolhouse, wherever they were going to play that night. And it's still the same today. Still the same You're today. Still doing we the same thing. Still have live music, live programming. We don't know any other way. I don't. I can't foresee us becoming fully automated. Now, at times, we're automated overnight, but that's the only time you'll not have an announcer talking to you, not at you. We we really take a lot of pride in our announcers being very personable, friendly, warm voice on the air. If you think about it, some people don't have any companionship except what they hear on the radio station. That's for sure. That's for sure. So it's important that we at least provide that service. If, let's say, a homebound person not able to go anywhere, all day long they can listen to WPAQ and enjoy it and get something out of it. All right, what I'd like to show you is a picture of the very first band that performed on WPAQ. This was during the test sessions after midnight when they could go full power. My dad would turn on the transmitter all the way and they would test to see how we were getting out, how it sounded. This is Glenn McPeak and the Green Valley Boys. And this fella right here is Benton Flippin. And uh, he is, uh, he's a fiddle player. And he's probably the very first person to, to start with sound on the station. He bowed the fiddle and then the band joined in. And then this is a, another group. This is a contemporary group, Doyle Lawson and Quicksilver. Contemporary and mean, meaning that one that came along many, many years later. This was done back in the 1990s, I believe. They wanted, they loved WPAQ so much. Doyle Lawson, the leader of the group, he wanted to come and to have a picture made with his group around that microphone, the WPAQ microphone and to do a, an album, a whole album, dedicated to the station and my dad, Ralph Epperson. There's a picture of my dad in the liner notes of the album, and uh, just a, a, a great compact disc. We play it a lot on the station, but that was a real, a real treat. He wanted, uh, Doyle Lawson wanted to buy the microphone from my dad. He said, I'm sorry, it's not for sale. <laughs> now, did they play here many times, and that's why they... They've played here a few times. And they're very they're a prof professional group, right. and so they're, they're booked to play a lot of places around the country. And it was an honor to have them to come and play. Absolutely. And just to have pictures made here at the station. How about that? That's quite the honor, wasn't it? I'm sorry? That's a great honor, wasn't it? That was a tremendous honor. We were so blessed. And they are one of many who have come in down through the years, uh, in the later years. We had tons of them during the early days. But in the 1980s, we had the Johnson Mountain Boys, Doc Watson. has been here. Again, Doyle Lawson and Quicksilver. The Graskels, they're a very popular group today. And just countless others still wanting to come in and be heard over the radio station and perform right here in Studio A. Old time... Uh uh, I guess it's uh, the old time feel they have with the, with the station being so old and everything. Yeah, it's some kind of a feeling you can't describe. It's ho hallowed ground, hallowed ground, and you you just get a certain special. I don't know. It's it's a spirit that's here, that's in this building. There's a soul 
there's some soul here or spirit that's, that drives them to want to be here each and every time they come. They want to be on the air, and if they make a mistake, they just pick right up where they made the mistake and keep going. It's live radio. It's beautiful. It works still. So let's talk about the merry-go-round program again. Uh, some, you all are talked about it, and, but we really didn't explain what that is. That's a live broadcast at the Earl Theater. And, and when did that start? When did it move to the Earl Theater? Okay. What year do you think? you remember what year it might have moved there? The merry-go-round actually started on WPAQ the very week we signed on the air. Okay. And it was first held at the radio station. And what happened was the original MC, Uncle Joe Johnson, and his wife, pretty blue-eyed Odessa, they were the stars of the merry-go-round in the early days. It got so that the station was getting filled up with spectators. People were coming, and the wives wanted to come and see what the old man was doing on Saturday. They knew that she knew he was up here making music. Well, the lobby was full of people. The driveway was full of cars. They were parked down the road. You couldn't get in this place. The ones that were going to be on the radio couldn't even get in here to play. There were so many people. And Uncle Joe went to my dad and said, Ralph, we got to do something about this. So they figured out that they could take this show on the road. And on the road they did. They went to the Pick Theater, which was across the street from the Earl Theater. And they stayed there many, many years. Came back probably in the 1960s to be inside the studio of WPAQ in this very room. Clyde Johnson would sit at that desk with that microphone. He was the MC that served for a tremendous amount of time after Uncle Joe Johnson. He passed in 2007. So you can imagine his tenure from the 60s till 2007 as the MC of the merry-go-round, WPAQ merry-go-round. And then in 1998, my dad and I went to Surrey Community College and made a presentation about the station to a group of uh, well-to-do, well-off people in the education field. And um, the director of the Surrey Arts Council, Tanya Reese, was in attendance. She's Tanya Jones now. And she was so taken by what WPAQ is all about and that we had a live show at a theater back in the old days. She had a grand idea. Let's, let's take that back on the road. Let's bring it to the Earl Theater. It was the cinema theater then. Let's get that to the cinema theater and start those days back up again. So in 98, we returned to downtown Mount Airy and started playing at the cinema. Later, it was changed back to the Earl, the original name of the theater. And we've been there ever since. Here we are in 2023. So since 1998, we're still coming to you from the Earl Theater. And it, it's transmitted through a Marty transmitter. And it sends a signal through the air. There's an antenna on top of the building here. It goes into a receiver here at the station. And then we pipe that through the control board and into a pot. And then you turn that up on the board, and there they are every Saturday, just like that. Tell All me right. a little bit about these signs you got up here. Be glad to. These signs were uh, made by my father. Uh, he was very particular about how this place was kept. He wanted to make sure that uh, dirt didn't get tracked into the building. Uh, and he was very, uh, very, um, well, let me say that again. Uh, he was pretty strict about being silent when you were back in the control room. He didn't want anybody or anything just going out over the air while an announcer was talking or doing a commercial live on the air. And he didn't want just anybody to come in off the street. Tried to protect the announcers a little bit. Right. But there, there are signs like this uh, in the building here, and they're all original. And we found a sign on the piano in Studio A. There were so many articles, just junk, a pile of stuff on the top of the piano. We got all that off one day. And there was another sign sitting there and says, please do not leave articles on this piano too late let me get that fit footage just hey, i saw that yeah let me so yeah. i can throw that in as b footage okay. i'll get that sign okay. right there yeah i saw that so this was laying underneath all of it yeah <laughs> so 
somebody's wood burned or is that painted maybe paint it's paint okay all right i'll use those b footage there so okay. i'll throw that in as you're talking out there okay They said, they said this this station was so well built that it'd take a bomb to bring it down. Oh yeah. Yeah. Now, did your dad and grandpa actually physically build it? They have contractors come out, or we had uh, we had some that would come out. They had bricklayers, and uh, they did a lot of the woodwork. My dad and grandpa, Harry Epperson, and they had a tower erector crew from Petersburg, Virginia, to come. And I can tell you a funny story about that. When they were putting the tower up back in the mid 1940s, it took them quite a while. My dad was a perfectionist. He had it. He was very particular about how things were built. It had to be just right, or he'd make them tear it down and do it again. Well, we had a group of tower erectors from Virginia to come, and uh, there were several guys on the ground at the base of the tower, and there were others up on the tower working, building it up. And there was a preacher who wanted time on the radio station. And he was following my dad around, trying to get him to commit to letting him be on the radio. I want time on your station, Ralph. I want to preach. I want a preaching program on your station. Well, my dad, he told me, he said, I was in such a way that I wanted this place to be built so we could get on the air. He said, but this, this, this preacher just kept being persistent, wanting time on the station. He said, while that was going on, he could hear the tower erectors up on top of the tower shouting profanity back down to the crew on the, on the ground. Back and forth, a lot of profanity was shared. And finally, the preacher got so upset, and he said, Well, I just tell you what, Ralph, if you ever do get this place going, it's going to take about a three months revival to get things right around here. <laughs> get to, get things cleansed out. Huh? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, did he get on the air? Did the preacher get on the air? I think he did. I think he, I think did. he got did. in the spot. I think he finally Sounds got like on. Sounds like he's pretty persistent. With he it. was real persistent. My dad is pretty patient with people. Yeah. So you got two. You got two. Uh, a B. Well, we, this is an original studio, like Studio A, just much smaller. Now it's the the studios to WSYD, our sister station, oh, okay. which is a classic hit station. Now this is the control room for WPAQ, and we'll walk in here. And this is where all the famous announcers and current announcers play records. We still play records. We have a whole room of records. And that's just a part. You look around and see there are crates of records all over the room in here. CDs, we still play CDs. We play cassette tapes. Here's a preacher on right now. There's a religious block that's on two hours of the day. And he's getting ready to end, so watch him. Watch him take a program off. You just heard the Northside Baptist Church of Winston Salem program with their good call. And thank you for. Time now for the Old Trailblazer broadcast with Pastor Albert Pendarvis. The Old Trailblazer broadcast can be heard Monday through Friday at 11.15 a.m. as well as Sundays at 6.15 a.m. here on WPAQ, AM 740 FM 106.7, Mount Airy, North Carolina. This is the Old Trailblazer broadcast. This is Pastor Albert Pendarvis. That's how it's done. Sorry. This is Tim oh. Fry. Tim, good to meet you, sir. Tim Sorry Fry. To get you out of the way. Oh, well, I understand. you got to get it done. He's our, our music director, and he's the morning and midday personality on the air and uh, he's been with us for a long time since 1987 in some form of capacity he's he's been full-time with us since about 2003 or 4 I think well that's a that's great Did now, a good job looks like yeah he's he's one of he's my right arm I tell you he does a lot of good for this radio station if you have an MVP he's the man here but this control board is probably about uh, 25 or so years old. We had an old Collins board, which was the same as the original board. It wasn't the original, but it was like the very original board. We had just conducted a tour with Boy Scouts back in the late 90s, 
And just as soon as we show, showed the board to them and how radio works in the control room here, they left. I walked back in and the, the board had blown up. It had caught fire. And that was the end of, of that. So you and go then off we, the air for a while? To get oh, yeah. We were off the air for, for quite a while until we got things back in operation. Had to get a new board. Um, and that, that's the board that we got. We replaced it. So what's this equipment behind you here? What, what we got going on here? Well, we've got one of the, the most important piece of equipment here is the EAS system. And this is to uh, alert our listeners when there's a bad storm in the vicinity, uh, tornado warning or a severe thunderstorm warning or an amber alert. And yesterday we had the nationwide test at 220, which all radio stations all television stations around the country and cell phone users had a an alarm to go off. This this sounded and it broadcasts over the air for a, a few seconds. And but this other equipment is like processing equipment to make it sound a little better. And some of this is pretty old. Uh, there are some original pieces right in here. Still in, in use. And this you? right here. Well, no, a lot of that's not used anymore. But we, we don't have anywhere to put it, so we just leave it in there. Just leave it in here kind of like museum pieces. Right, now what, yeah. There's a, what's all this in the back back here? You've got this crazy amount of stuff back here. In both well, there's, there's there's more. There's the Marty receiver I talked about for the merry-go-round. That's what in there. That's in there. And there's some other uh, equipment that goes along with helping us sound better. And then part of it helps WSYD signal go from here across town to where the tower and transmitter are for it. And the FM transmitters, we have an FM translator there in that room, but our big transmitter for the AM, the 10,000 watt AM transmitter is in this room. It's a Harris transmitter and it, it goes 10,000 watts and it's been around since the 90s at some point and still does pretty well. At times we have a fuse blown or a capacitor blown, but we get to get it replaced and get back to going again. And we've got a backup transmitter. Okay, in case that one goes down, you got something to back up with. I want to show you a sign here that might give you a little chuckle. My dad uh, made that sign back in '98. <laughs> snakes entering. <laughs> we have an abundance of black snakes. We have a kudzu field all around this property. And they're full of black snakes, so get, it's common this one time come of in year. On the live broadcast. Well, yeah, there've been uh, there've been times we had we met one coming down the hall one Saturday. The front door had been left open, so one made its way down the hallway, headed this way. But we we've found several inside this room. They like the warm transmitter, and they'll get up on it or along the side there, and sometimes up in this window, they'll be. So. We try to keep those out from here. <laughs> the announcers are not very, very fond of them. You have to keep an air conditioner running in there to keep that yes, cool. It looks like keep, it put off a lot of heat, I imagine. It would. It does. It puts off a lot. So we do have air, air conditioning. Yes. Let's take a look at all these albums in here. How do okay. you find a, How do you find something in all these? You got crates of them right here. Well, we either go to Tim if we don't know where. <laughs> no, we, we have them uh, in alphabetical order. Uh, but even then, these there's so many records, it's hard to keep up with all of them. They get, they get out in, in order. They get out of order. They get in other places. But these are some of the main ones that we use still, and they're worn. They're, they don't have records to replace these anymore. Uh, and these records along the side here still used. Now, there we've got crates of records all over the place. And there's nowhere else to put them. We don't have enough room, but we got to have them because we get requests for songs that only on records. They were never digitized. I noticed that uh, it seems like the uh, vinyl's coming back. People starting to buy it again. Vinyl is popular again, and I'm glad because yeah. there's nothing like the sound of a record, in my opinion. What's the difference? Well, I don't know. It's crisp. It's it's full bodied. And it just has a better tone to it, from from my ears at least. The That's nature. why I like records. And there's something about watching a record go round and round. It, you're drawn by it. Absolutely. You're drawn to it. This is an old piece of equipment. 
Uh, this was used especially to record like a church service that we had to tape delay. We would record a whole service. This was had big, uh, let me remove this. It had big tape, tape reels, and it would take up a whole hour because most of a, a tape would take up about 30 minutes. But this would take up a whole hour and we could record a church service, say at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning, and then replay it a little after 11. Go back, rewind it, play it a little after 11. We had, what we, we used was a patch panel, and through the telephone company, we had a remote loop line. And there was a patch, a control board downtown, and they would switch it every week. We had several churches that we would pick up a service from over a remote line through the telephone company. And we had to patch, we had to patch into the right holes. That's something never, we don't do anymore. Well, this has been amazing. I mean, everybody here is going to learn a whole lot of stuff that they really had no idea was going here. Um, I'm Once again, I'm just blessed to live in this community and live in this town. Tell us a little bit more about your home away from home. Well, they told me that I was here at a very early age. In fact, they used to change my diaper on a table in the lobby. Wow. So I've not been far from this place all these 60, almost 62 years for me. Wow, that's that's amazing. I mean, your DNA is all over the place. Then, hopefully, it's not the same table. Right? No, I think I think that's one thing that's gone from here. But most most everything's still around. When when did you start? Um, now you, obviously you're an announcer here. You're a great announcer. Uh, well, love you. You get that you. smooth voice, and and you, I'll pay you later. Okay. okay. All right. But, um, when did you start announcing here? When did you go on the air? Actually, the first time was in the summer before my sophomore year in high school. And I came up here to get the job. I applied just like anybody else would. I dressed up in a suit, wow. coat and tie, and came and spoke to the manager back then, Blair Eubanks. Okay. I went into his office, and I was nervous. <laughs> so nervous, even though I was going to be hired because I'm the owner's son. <laughs> But still, I, I went through the process. My dad made me do that. That's and important. I had to go do an audition tape. I was taken back in the back. I had to read some weather, some news, and a commercial just to see how I sounded. You remember what and the commercial was? No, I don't, but I'm sure it's a business that's no longer around. <laughs> okay. And, uh, but anyway, I got the job. And I started working after school each day. I would come in and work for about three hours. I would, I would do the Sundown Serenade, which is our, our big band, Easy Listening Music. We do change format at 6 o'clock every right. night for about three hours. And that's big band music. And I love, that's how I became a big follower of big band. Uh, I would give the time and temperature. And the, the general manager, Blair Eubanks, he was real particular about how it sounded. So if he thought one of the records was not suitable, he'd give me a call. He'd say, don't play that again. <laughs> and Or he'd say, meet me in my office at 3.30 <laughs> tomorrow afternoon. But I, off and on uh, through high school, I would come up here every, every afternoon. I'd work on the weekends. I went to UNC Greensboro, also Surrey Community College. Through my college life, I would come home and work in the summers. And then in the summer of 84, I've been full-time ever since. I've been selling, announcing, news reporting, sports reporting, bill collecting, cleaning up, managing, and now owning. I think it's safe to say you are WPAQ. Well, and my wife, Jennifer. I'll have to give her credit. She writes our checks. Well, that's important. <laughs> well, we're blessed to have you and, and blessed to be in this community with such a, 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 a great resource, uh, the radio station and yourself and your family. And God bless you. Thank you so Thank much you. for taking some time out of your busy day to share that with us. And I guess it's time to go have some lunch. You buy? Uh, oh, of course I'll buy. Well, John will buy. He writes the checks. So okay. We'll get him to do I'm it. I'm in. All right. Let's do it. All right. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Norm. And uh, we're going to head out, and I think we're going to the Dairy Center, and we might run into somebody you know that comes up here and talks on the radio. 
the Honorable John Cawley. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Good so friends with with former baseball coach John Cawley. I, I really enjoy him. We, we can't, wait, we can't yeah. wait to get his story uh, uh, for everybody. You're going to love it. Great. Yep. Sounds well, thank good. you so much. Kelly. Thank you. And uh, my pleasure. We're going to uh, leave with uh, our, our goodbye wave. So uh, thank All you right. so much. Thank you, Norm. And you, right. you folks come back anytime. We're always giving tours. Thank you so much.